Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Institute of Coaching's podcast, Coaching Revealed. My name is Jeffrey Hull. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, and I am super excited to introduce our second series, where over several episodes over the next few weeks, we will be interviewing top thought leaders, researchers, and coaches to learn more about the science and practice of health and wellness coaching. As the field of coaching has evolved since its earliest days, the space of health and wellness has also become more and more prevalent, especially in the post-pandemic world. We now see people focused on their ability to thrive, to understand themselves, to combat burnout, to optimize understanding and self-awareness, and to prioritize their health in a holistic sense. For people to learn how to do this in a rapidly changing environment, we entrust some of that responsibility to health and wellness coaches, becoming more and more prevalent across the United States, Western Europe, and the rest of the world. In the upcoming episodes, we will look at workplace wellness, physician coaching, stress management, wellness in nature, internal family systems, and much, much more. We'll take the time to assess the origins of the field of health and wellness coaching and learn what is in store for us as the field begins to grow and expand. For anyone that's not yet familiar with the Institute of Coaching, or as we like to say, the IOC, we are a coaching nonprofit research-based center based at a McLean Hospital, which is part of the Mass General Brigham Health Institute affiliated with one of the largest psychiatric hospitals in uh, Harvard Medical School. At the IOC, we work to provide our members with one of the most comprehensive libraries of coaching science resources, along with a global network of fellow coaches and regular programming to translate the science and the research behind effective coaching. You can learn from, rely on, and build relationships with all of us as we continue to learn from the practice, help evolve the profession. I'm super excited to have you continue on this journey with us. So welcome to series two of Coaching Revealed. I am super excited to be kicking off our second series on coaching in health and wellness domain. And for that, we have a very special guest to help me kick things off. My dear friend, Margaret Moore, who is the chair at the Institute of Coaching and also one of the key thought leaders in the space of health and wellness coaching over many, many, many decades. So we have someone who is really one of the key founders of this profession in the house. And as I said, a dear friend of mine, a colleague that I work with every day over the last 15 years. So it's really fun to have an opportunity to actually interview Margaret. But let me just take one minute to give you a little background, because for those of you that are listening in for the first time, you may not have heard of Margaret Moore, although I think many of us know her name well. But Margaret is an executive coach and a health and wellness coaching specialist and trainer, she co-founded not just the Institute of Coaching, which is the, bringing you this podcast, but also two other organizations. Since 2000, she founded a company called Well Coaches, which is one of the largest coach training institutes in the world, and also the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. So I could go on and on. She has a very storied background, multiple um, peer-reviewed articles in the health and wellness coaching space. She's also the author of three best-selling books from Harvard. I will let her jump into her background for us, but I just want to say it's so much fun to have you here, Margaret. Welcome. Thank you, Jeff. It's good to be here. And um, this is a, a big part of my legacy, so I'm, I'm happy to be able to be with you and talk about it today. Well, I think it's kind of a rare moment, right? Because you and I have been working together. I started volunteering at the Institute of Coaching back in the early 2010s, and you had founded the Institute with Susan David and Carol Kaufman just a few years before that. And here we are in 2024. The Institute is a global organization with over 5,000 members, and you are also the CEO and the startup uh, entrepreneur behind Well Coaches, one of the most successful coach training organizations in the health and wellness space, and then a whole long litany of other things that I just began to mention. 
I think maybe a good place to start would be, um, I know in your roots, you're a biologist at heart. That's where you came up through and you're a Canadian. And, you know, so for folks that don't know you personally, it might be good to just go back to how you grew up and started finding your way into this amazing profession. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, well, um, I say the first thing uh, is that I am an adventurous spirit, and and um, I wanted to get in bi- into biotechnology in the early '80s when it was just getting started. Um, because it was a new business, and I and so when I entered into my, to the MBA program at the Ivy School of Business in Canada, I was looking to get started in biotech, and uh, and I did. Uh, I finished my MBA at London Business School, and I joined. Um, I, I worked for six years in the UK for two biotechnology organizations. That's how I got started. I, there was no way I could get a green card at that point, And there wasn't a lot happening in Canada. So I went far, far from my home base to start in biotech. And um, that was 17 years. Um, probably the most notable part was that I was in the vaccines industry. And um, I launched yeah, I was the CEO of a, bi- a biotech vaccines company, which was within the Pasteur Mary O'Connor world and now Sanofi. So I was into prevention and I was into, you know, population health. And um, I got to a certain point in my biotech career where I felt as though I could keep going for another few startups and rounds. Um, but I was watching, you know, everybody's state of health and seeing that people were just not taking good care of themselves, particularly my MD, PhD colleagues. And so when I started Well Coaches, which was actually my husband's idea, because he's a biotechnology patent lawyer, um, which was what brought me to the US. Um, He was my lawyer, in fact. I saw coaching as the future, both as a new profession in healthcare, as well as an intervention that could treat and even now we know can even reverse chronic disease with lifestyle medicine. So I started Well Coaches. Um, at the time, there wasn't a tradition of science-based coaching and there wasn't a curriculum for coaches in healthcare. This is actually a question I've always wanted to ask you, and this is the perfect time to do it. I'm just curious, you know, way back then, was there a moment when coaching came to your came into your mind, like as opposed to nursing or becoming a physician or becoming any other healthcare provider? What was it that triggered coaching? It's a really good point. Um, because in my biotech career, um, I coached a lot of PhD scientists who would never been in the business world before. And I did that a lot. I wrote an article in my 20s about how, how scientists could you know find their way in the business world. Um, and so I worked with many, many scientists, helping them find their groove in a commercial setting. And I realized I enjoyed the development of people and I didn't know anything about coaching. I didn't even know anything about well-being or wellness, to be honest. I just thought, yeah, this feels like this is where I could enter, but I was going to be the business person. I wasn't planning on being a coach. And in the early days, I wanted to move coaching forward as an intervention. Um, But in the early days, uh, two things happened. One is I realized there wasn't a coaching curriculum suitable for coaching in healthcare. So I started from scratch, building new competencies, meeting all the key scientists, putting the theories together with eventually a team of 10 of us wrote the first coaching psychology manual in 2008. It took us eight years of work to build all of that, learning the science and integrating it and teaching it and practicing it, really focused on bringing science to coaching. And so that was really an important part of it. Um, And then the other uh, important part of coming out of biotechnology is that I knew that we had to, we had to have outcomes. And what I brought to the Institute was knowing that we could build coaching curriculum and train coaches and test their skills, but we then have them um, have their study, their results studied in the real world. And um, 22 different groups, um, mostly in the United States, studied the the, um, outcomes, coaching outcomes of the Well Coaches coaches using the Well Coaches protocol, all of which is published now. And we were able to show significant improvements in all these studies. How did you convince people to join Well Coaches in the first place? 
Ready to advance your coaching practice? Join the Institute of Coaching and tap into the world's leading resource for coaching science and professional development. With over 4,000 members across 130 countries, the IOC offers invaluable networking opportunities with an elite global coaching community and innovative learning to broaden your knowledge and keep you at the forefront of coaching best practices. Engage in cutting edge learning events with world renowned coaching scholars, from webinars and seminars to discussion groups, research projects, and more. Try any membership free for 30 days. Use promo code IOC Podcast and visit instituteofcoaching.org backslash join to get started. You know, I learned from biotech that you build around you an advisory board of prominent scientists, even Nobel Prize winners, you know, you really bring. And so early on, we went to what was at the time in our space, the most prestigious medical society, the American College of Sports Medicine that crosses over exercise and behavior change. And, um, and they became a partner in 2002. So the first marketing email for well coaches went to their mailing list. And as a result, you know, in the first few years, we got up to, you know, nearly a thousand coaches trained. Um, then the field started to grow. Then others came behind us, academics, you know, Karen Lawson, University of Minnesota. 10 years later, we had about 12 programs. Um, there are two main populations, um, the exercise physiologists, because they're natural cheerleaders, you know, they're naturally positive. They have very um, nat natural inclinations to see the good in people and to help them do well. You know, they're not clinical. They're not looking for problems. The other group, just because it's the largest group is nurses and nur nurses. A lot of the nurses have gone into yoga and exercise, whole food nutrition, because they are interested in, you know, in wellness. And so those would be the two main groups. Now we have doctors and psychologists and social workers and dietitians. And so it's a, it's a pharmacist. It's a broad group now. Yeah. Now I, I have a couple of physician friends um, that have gone through your program. My friend Pascal that we've spoken about, French engineer, has gone through the Well Coaches program and he's a Harvard pain, Harvard trained pain doc. Um, so today I think, yeah, uh, probably a lot of the people listening to this um, are well-versed in understanding that health and wellness coaching is just exploding and becoming something to be taken very seriously. But back then, it was really new for a lot of folks to think about adding coaching. Yeah, it was brand new. And I, one of the things I'm proud of is that, you know, we really did it right from the beginning. In contrast to many um, pockets of coaching that were, you know, quick overnight certifications with no training, no skills assessment, um, and, you know, lots of digital offerings out there with cheap coaching, a lot, lots and lots of corporate offerings of, you know, 10 minute coaching sessions. And so we always carried the flag for excellence um, from the beginning, excellent coaching, which meant longer coaching sessions that were generative, that led to sustainable change. And we focused on um, the, the heart of a coaching session being the one where, where people have a an unresolved you know, obstacle in the moment and that there's a generative, creative, nonlinear conversation to help them see things differently, you know, switch, shift their vantage point, have new insights, integrate that, and then come out with a new mindset so that they can go forward to change their lifestyle behaviors. Because most people, you know, right now, I mean, I just saw some new data, 80% of the population of adults are not engaged in the top four out of five of the top health behaviors. Now, the five are um, a healthy diet, healthy weight, regular exercise, not smoking, and moderate drinking. Those are the five that are you. So tell us about how you, uh, you, you said what, 2002 was the starting point? Yeah, so then the Institute of Coaching came along in 2009, right? So how did you and Carol and Susan and a little bit about how that all came to be? Yeah, so I started to go to the International Coach Federation meeting, I think 2003 might have been my first one. We ha And I presented at the uh, ICF's Coaching Research Symposium. And that's where I met Carol. 
Um, out of that meeting, uh, I led a team that created a theory for the intuitive dance coaching, which Carol was part of, as was David Drake, Francine Campone, and Bob Chan and Moran. And we published a paper a year later at ICF's next coaching research symposium on the intuitive dance of coaching. We called it relational flow, um, which was based on, you know, the relational version of Cheek Set Me High's um, theory. So Carol and I started conversations in 2004 and we, we turned that into coaching curriculum, which we taught together. Uh, we, uh, I invited Carol when I was doing um, a week of coach training in, it was in Shanghai and um, Kuala Lumpur. So we were in Asia together, like 2007 or so. And what kind of coaching did they want to learn at that point? Was the- Well, there we were teaching that particular program. We were teaching mental health professionals about health and wellness coaching. So Carol was really strong on positive psychology. And then we also were going to the positive psychology conferences, which is how I began to incorporate positive psychology among with my colleagues into the Well Coaches curriculum, which is now baked into the national standards for coaching billing codes. Um, so um, we we were going to these conferences and I started asking, you know, Robert Bissell, Steiner and everybody I could talk to like, we need an academic home for coaching. Any ideas? Like, where can we do this? And I just, you know, we would, we chat about this. And and then, and I started to, as Carol will tell the story, I started to say to Carol, you know, we should start an academic institute at McLean. You're based there. This would make sense. And she wanted to start a positive psychology institute. And um, in the end, we did. And we, the first thing we did was start the conference. And so we applied to Harvard Medical School for the first conference. What was their reaction to the idea of doing a conference on coaching back then? Uh, well, we we had um, we got through the CME department. David Eisenberg at that point, if you know David, um, was on the CME committee. And so we got through. We had a tougher time the next year because uh, they didn't like the way um, – that Tony Grant had published the bibliography of research. It was not medical grade. And so we had to do some work to get approved for the second year. But once that was going, we kept going. And then at the first conference, um, Carol leveraged that into a pre-conference with Ruth Ann Harnish's help. And Ruth Ann was very impressed with what Carol produced. It was amazing, Um, a couple of days. um, And we've still got pictures of it, you know, from 2008. And the conference was sold out and we were bursting the seams in the in the ballroom with 450 people. Um, and so that began the conference and Ruth Ann was so impressed that she offered to start the Institute of Coaching with a $2 million donation, which we took to Scott Rausch and McLean. And that's when they let us become an institute. Um, so that's, yeah, so that those were that first 10 years. I mean, it's amazing to think about that when you think that, you know, I probably started my coaching career in 2011, 2012. You know, even when I first went to the Institute of Coaching Conference, it was it was still very much a question as to whether coaching would be a profession. And, and now I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, you know, even then in 2011, 2012, we were wondering about coaching as a profession and you had already been doing it for many, many years. You know, folks like you have gone from really groundbreaking to leading a profession in the space of two decades, which is extraordinary when you think about it. I want to ask you about what's going on now in the health and wellness space and think about how many light years we are from where we were. I mean, this idea that lifestyle, wellness, integrating with leadership, which you know, you and I are now very much involved in post-pandemic, um, it was really new just 10 years ago. And now it's considered, you know, for most organizations to think about health and wellness as part of their DNA, I think, if they want to survive. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. There's. I mean, the, the wellness industry, corporate wellness industry goes back a few decades and that, that led to one branch in, in our field. Another branch was integrative medicine. Then there's functional medicine and then there's lifestyle medicine. So there's a lot of different threads, but um, the one thing we accomplished, so the other startup was the Nas- what is now the National Board for Health and Wellness Coaching. And, and so 
um, we gathered about a dozen of us together. Um, actually, we met just after one of our conferences in 2010. We had 70 people at Babson College. Um, that became a consortium. And the biggest thing we accomplished in those first couple of years was to agree that there was only one thing, that health coaching, wellness coaching, integrative health coaching were all the same thing. The coaching, as opposed to separating out the nurses doing chronic disease from the wellness coach, that was a major accomplishment. And then when we got the standards together, um, you'll see there's a lot of science in the competencies, which came out of um, a lot of work that I was involved in, you know, through, because our manual is, has sold almost, well, it's now about 50,000 copies. So it's become the textbook for the field, which meant that all these, all the scientific threads were woven in um, from the beginning, which meant that well-being was there from the beginning, because because self-efficacy and intrinsic motivation and positive emotions and self-compassion and all those things are baked into the coaching competencies and health and wellness, which, which hasn't yet happened for um, the general competency set elsewhere. And which is why that has led me, and I wanted to, you know, I actually did want to build a leadership coaching school at the beginning. So I was talked out of it um, and reg- and missed it all the way along um, because I really did. That was, you know, I was always a leader from a young age. And so I, I really did want to do that. But um, I, I've only been able to my, m- move into leadership in the last, say, since about 2015 or so. I began to first with transformational leadership because it's directly overlaps with coaching and then beyond. And so Now, you and I, I know we're very much aligned in that well-being and leadership and coaching are all built on the same building blocks. They're not, they're all, they're all really about optimizing human thriving. So there's, there's a strong foundation that came out of the work that I led in the early 2000s that now seems, you know, every day. um, Because Thomas Leonard and Coach um, Coach A, Laura Whitworth, those original coaches were not reading about behavior change and emotional intelligence and neuroscience. And Well, they weren't psychologists either. It really didn't grow out of a psychology area. It grew, it grew out of more career counseling and um, transition counseling, things like that. Um, but yeah, the intersection of these yeah. things was for quite a long time, even at the Institute of Coaching was somewhat siloed. Remember, I remember going into my first volunteer work with you and Carol and talking about, you know, we're going to have a leadership coaching space, we're going to have a positive psychology spoke, we're going to have a well coaches, uh, health and wellness space, we're gonna have a career and, you know, in some ways, they were all rather artificially constructed. Because at the end of the day, the pandemic reminded us all that whether you're working through a transition or a challenge as a leader, or you're trying to get the best out of your people inside an organization, you know, the health, organizational health, all of those things are really different variations of the same thing. And so now we're in a place, I think, where we can bring them all under one umbrella. And, um, it's quite extraordinary when you think not only has coaching become a profession, but it's an integrated profession, it's fast growing profession. And, you know, I'm curious to hear from you. You and I talk about this all the time. It's, it's our bread and butter, but our listeners are probably interested in hearing, you know, what do you see as the future for the field? And what do you see as the opportunity for coaches? Well, I, in this regard, I think we do need to think about it by market sector. Um, you know, I'm an MBA and, and the market sectors are very different. So let me take one at a time. The next frontier for health and wellness coaching, while there is, there have been some amazing scientists getting large NIH grants to do um, exceptional studies of coaching for hypertension and weight loss and diabetes and chronic pain and cancer, in order to secure um, ongoing payment by insurance and Medicare. Um, they want us to make sure that when we deliver these services in medical practices, that that the outcomes are significant and not trivial. And because a lot of what's done in healthcare doesn't lead to 
significant outcomes. It doesn't move the needle. So the next phase is sort of both a business launch as well as a ongoing study of the outcomes of coaching. So the coaches in healthcare and corporate wellness are going to be required to show that the needle is being moved. The numbers are moving, both the biological numbers, but also the quality of life and mental well-being numbers. So we're going to be called to a higher standard of measurement and proof of of outcome than any other profession in healthcare. So that's a high bar, but I think it's a good bar because it will be a big investment if so many people will benefit from it that it need to be does need to work. And so that's that thrust. I, I think in in general, the other thing I would say about where AI is going, you know, our Harvard Medical School Conference last April, we had Nikki Terblanche study of a chatbot compared to uh, coaching with respect to the intervention of goal setting. So it was a, a, a defined intervention. And when you, when, and a lot of health and wellness coaching is habit making, that is very well suited to technology. Imagine your Siri saying, hey, um, hey Siri, I want to try a new sleep habit tonight. You know, and it searches the database for the three top habits for people your age and demographic. and do you want to try this? Well, here's a quick tutorial. Do you like it? Do you, do you want me to remind you in the morning how it went? You know, so basically the, the tech can actually help you make habits. The bigger part for coaching is the mindset shifts. You know, how do I go from, you know, the mindset that led to a chronic disease or chronic stress to a mindset that's generative of wellness and positivity and thriving? There's a lot of chips shifts in mindset, um, learning, perspective, and then even identity. Those shifts are not going to be, they're, they're a nonlinear conversation, getting people to expand their, the way they think about themselves. That is not easy. And that's all, that's why we did the theory for intuitive dance years ago, because we wanted to operationalize it. Coaches are engaging in a conversation that leads people to see themselves, their situation and the world differently session by session by session, likely expanding, integrating neural networks, building new neural networks. You can only do a millimeter of new neural network a day. So it takes a while. And that ability is going to be beyond the ability of machines. And so what we're going to see is um, a, a need to be um, more uh, masterful at having coaching sessions that leave people saying, wow, I, I feel differently than when I started and want to come back, you know, so, so outcomes data, we're making a difference and we're making a difference that doesn't happen in other interventions. Say a little bit more, because what came up to my mind as you were speaking, and it's very rich when you think about where we are on the precipice of AI becoming a, a, a tool that coaches may interact with or may augment coaching practice. But as you were speaking about, um, making mind shifts, the thing that popped into my mind was that working through trauma, because the story that people have about themselves, I know myself when I was in psychotherapy, one of the things we do in that world is to look at your childhood and your traumatic experiences that led to the story that you have about your identity, which often then translates into your behavior, into your fears, into whether you take care of yourself or don't take care of yourself, into isolation, socialization, all of those things. And, and you know, loneliness is now a huge issue in our society. Addiction, clearly, often has traumatic sources. Um, so I'm curious, like, what role do you envision the evolution of coaching having? And is there an AI place to play in that space? So you're talking about the intersection of coaching and mental health services? Yeah, which I think we are in general, right? When you think about mindset change, there is right. So um, there's a there's a lot to say about this. Um, first, there's a there is a real decline in mental well being in the population. Um, right. For you know, and and some of it has to do with undigested adverse experience and even trauma as a really big one. Um, you know, post-traumatic growth is an inspiring model for coaches to follow. There may be a therapeutic 
impact of what we're doing, but we're not intending to heal. We're intending to help people grow. So there's the opportunity for coaches is to leverage the principles of post-traumatic growth and help people make more meaning, create richer relationships, see, uh, become, you know, turn their experience into strength, um, you know, take on creative tasks, which are a great way to express um, and transform the pain. And, and also um, to, to see new opportunities, you know, the interesting thing, you know, in the broken glass after a, a tragic situation, there are sprouts, you know, there's things there looking for your attention that are new opportunities that, that came as a result of the tragedy. And so, so I think that's our strength. And it turns out that the post-traumatic growth principles are the same as the job crafting principles how to make your job support your thriving, you know, and, and take accountability and be proactive about it at work. And they're the same principles of, um, you know, self-actualizing as well. So, so again, the same principles apply recovering from trauma to having, uh, designing yourself a great job and, and then and leading and well-being. So I think in that sense, um, we have a lot to offer in the mental well-being space, knowing that we're still not going to be the ones that are digging up and and doing the, the deeper healing work that people need to do as well. No, I completely agree. I think as far back as my PhD program, when I was studying group therapy and community-based healing and really investigating why are groups the place where people, when they feel safe, actually are more likely to have a breakthrough. You know, it's, it's, it's because you have that sense of being seen by more than just one person, that sense of commun communitarian belonging. And now, you know, Amy Edmondson is now writing about all of this, of course, and many others that we know well, and how that fits into the organizational space. And what I love is that, you know, you spent, you, you talk about green shoots out of the glass. I mean, I think you think we can think of the pandemic that way because one of the positives out of the pandemic has come this, the walls have come tumbled down in terms of this organizational space, workspace, life space, as if they're all separate entities and they're not interrelated. We're all humans in a communal space and work is one more communal space. And so the idea that we would want to leverage all of these modalities so that you can really get the best potential out of each person, not just at home, but at work, right? Um, I think it's a huge opportunity that coaching is so well positioned to take advantage of because it doesn't require you to go down a long journey back into your early childhood, which can be extremely valuable, but it doesn't always have a potential outcome that it's attached to. And it's also something that can be done in the world in an organization, in a team. You know, I, I feel like people like you at the van, were at the vanguard, gosh, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> and now just coming in, into a place where it's not only accepted, but, you know, there's people all over the world getting on the bandwagon. Um, as we know, it's one of the fastest growing professions. I'm curious, maybe we can kind of end with tips that you might have for coaches that are looking at having a more integrated approach, you know, the idea of silos is understandable. You need a niche, you need to have a brand, but also to have a more integrated approach because you may be asked to team coach, you may be asked to group coach, you may be asked to work in life issues, you may be asked to do so many different things. Don't shut yourself down, you know, leave yourself open to lifestyle, wellness, leadership. It's all one thing. So, to have you comment on that, I think would be really great. I want to talk about integration because that is uh, a big topic around well-being. Um, I think the first thing to say, though, is that we are all one: our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our emotions. You know, there it's all one system. And when our emotions are running high, that's a sign of imbalance. When our when our circulation isn't carrying enough nutrition or water or height, we're not hydrated. And I think the the appreciation that all of this is a whole and it it's and we as humans are all one thing. We don't just take our heads to work. 
And I think we, we've tended to, you know, focus on the thinking brain at work and leave behind the sensory brain, the intuitive brain and the, and the, um, the body. So I think that the fact that, uh, that, that there's a, there's a, we need to have a holistic approach to all of this is very important. And that the journey toward wholeness is integration. And by integration, I mean, when something's not working, like, you know, when you have an injury, your body integrates, it integrates the, the, the damaged cells and it, it moves them around. It integrates to the nu nutrients to create new cells. We're integration machines. We're constantly connecting one thing to another to create something new. What Rich Ryan's in self-determination theory and, and, and Dan Siegel have both put forward scientifically is that integration is a force of well-being. It's actually the, the potential in every more, moment is to integrate something that's not quite right into something better. And whether it's physical, mental, emotional, or um, spiritual, we're integration machines. And I think that is, if I had to say that what, what I brought to coaching that I didn't, couldn't even really name for a while was I was really good at integration. I could see how connecting two things would help something feel more whole, bring equanimity, move people to the next level of development. And so that is the force of well-being is integration of diverse things and things that are not quite right, whether it's severe trauma or just I'm tired today <laughs> or I don't I'm not looking forward to this conversation with my colleague. You know, I'm feeling unresolved. And so just recognizing that we're continually as humans moving towards more integration to more wholeness, whether we're leading, whether we're exercising, whether we're in our family, it's all one process with the same ingredients. And we're all human. And if people who are leading at work can see humans as humans as whole and integrating machines, growing machines, then um, we'll have respect for the process. And also, as you and I talk about, for the planet too, because we have to integrate right. the planet into our way now. We have to, you know, it's not a, it's not a foe. It's not a stranger. It's actually, we're part of it. And it's not separate from us, right? Yeah. We are inside it. We are the fish in the fishbowl. And then we're beginning to see that reality. So maybe I'll, you leave us with some thoughts about the future because you've been a visionary. You clearly are a visionary. I feel honored to have you as both a colleague and a friend and um, to be part of the leadership of, you know, a really very special organization where we bring coaches together from all over the world and uh, our tribe, I guess I would say. So think think big for me for the last couple of minutes as we close out what's it going to look like 10 years from now 20 years from now gosh you know i don't i don't spend a lot of time thinking ahead but i would say that but i'd say but i have a picture of the future i mean in healthcare i see there being most professions are around 100,000 professionals and i i see a world of you know 50 to 100,000 excellent coaches doing excellent work in doctor's offices in collaboration with them. They may be virtual, but they're integrated into the healthcare team. So I think that is the second thing, I think in the corporate space, um, you know, we're already seeing the democratization. We're gonna see more people with basic coaching skills, more of a coaching culture, more of a well-being culture. And then there will also be this professional class of coaches who are very skilled at helping people get through, um, you know, the, their growth stage, whatever that happens to be, their growth spurt. Um, Cause that's a, as you know, it's an intense conversation or series of conversations. Um, and, um, and I hope that coaching principles will be baked into family life. And, and, you know, when you go to the gym, you know, even now you're starting to see exercise, group exercise, use coaching principles. Um, you're seeing, coaching principles everywhere, you know, and they're basic principles of human well-being, self-determination, self-actualizing well-being. So I think the 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 well-being, um, we will help the well-being of every aspect of life. And the last thing I will say is that I I actually think the journey we're on is one of expanded consciousness, that that growth that we're doing, we're becoming more awake to who we are, what our purpose is, and where we're going. And I would encourage all coaches to set their compass on 
basically being more conscious than everybody else because otherwise we won't have a job. You know, we, we actually need to set the pace in terms of our own growth and being more awake and aware of how we can impact the world and how we can help other people do good. Um, so I think we're a positive force. I think we'll get stronger and better. And my, um, my, my torch is for excellence, that we work at continuing to be very um, masterful at this craft, because that is what is needed, is that to, to help people deal with this fractured world, we all need to grow and find our groove and make a difference. And that requires, you know, when you spend a lot of time grumpy and stressed and and anxious and you don't, you're not at your best. So we've got a lot of good work to do and, um, and excellence is our second name. And I think what you're pointing to is really powerful, which is role modeling for human potential in the future, really. I mean, this is I, when I was speaking to the ICF coaches in India, which is an incredibly vibrant, you know, next generation level of new coaches rising up and all over the world. And, and I, I shared with them similar thoughts, which is don't stop growing and learning yourself because the more you become awake, then you can always find a client. No matter how many bots there are or how many AI tools there are, if you represent energetically someone's potential just by who you are, not just what you do, but who you are and how you phrase a question, that you will always have a client. You may not become rich, but you will always have a client. So yeah, I am, I'm, I'm thrilled to work with you, to have you as a friend, to be part of a very special organization. I want to encourage everyone who's listening to this to go to institution, to institution, <laughs> to the institute of coaching.org. And if you're not a member of our institute, please consider joining us, becoming part of the community. Join us in May for our conference, May 3rd and 4th in Boston, sponsored by Harvard Medical School. And stay in touch with us. I know market is always open to hearing from you. Um, I know I am. Um, do you want to give contact information, Margaret, before we say goodbye? Yeah, sure. You can reach uh, me at Margaret at Institute of Coaching .org, um, And my personal website is coachmeg.com. Well, thank you all for joining us for this kickoff of our health and wellness coaching series over the next few weeks. So stay tuned, sign up and be in touch. Wishing you all the best. Take care. Bye bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of Coaching Revealed, brought to you by the Institute of Coaching. You can learn more about the Institute on our website at instituteofcoaching.org. You can stay up to date with new episodes of our podcast by liking and following Coaching Revealed. You can also find us on social media on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X with the handle Institute of Coaching. We also love hearing from our guests, so please reach out to us with thoughts you have on this episode and any questions you have about coaching. Until next time, this is Emily Tarani with Coaching Revealed.